Welcome back to iGen Politics. This is a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. My name is Victor Shi. I'm currently a sophomore at UCLA, was elected as the youngest delegate for Joe Biden, and I'm one of the co-hosts of this podcast. I'm Jill Wine-Banks, the author of The Watergate Girl, based on my experiences during the Watergate trial. I'm also the wearer of Jill's pins, and today's pins are in honor of our special guest. I'm wearing a United States Army pin on the top with the flag, and I'm also wearing a Ukrainian Pinocchio pin because our guest today has identified many Pinocchios from the former president. So it seemed totally appropriate to me to be wearing that. Um, Against the backdrop of slow chipping away of fundamental rights across the country, it's imperative that elected officials, public servants, and yes, young people and average voters to speak up and let their bosses, teachers, or elected officials know what's at risk and to do it based on solid knowledge and facts. But how does one do so when there's so much disinformation and polarization in our country? We have the perfect guess for that. There is no one to better represent the value of speaking up based on knowledge than our guest today, retired Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. You no doubt recognize him from his powerful testimony during then President Donald Trump's first impeachment hearing, which we will ask him about today. Colonel Vindman is also the author of the brand new book, Here Right Matters, An American Story about his life and the consequences of his testimony. We'll talk to him about that too. Previously, Colonel Vindman served as Director of European Affairs on the White House National Security Council. Um, He also worked at the Pentagon for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, He was a foreign area officer at U.S. embassies in uh, Ukraine and in Russia. Currently, Colonel Vindman is a doctoral student and a Foreign Policy Institute fellow at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. He is also a Pritzker Military Fellow at the Lawfare Institute. And I want to mention, of course, that the Pritzker Military Museum is right here in Chicago. And those of you who haven't seen it, you really must visit. It is a wonderful, um, interesting place. Um, So anyway, he is also a board member of the Renew Democracy Initiative, and is a visiting fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's uh, Perry World House. He's obviously quite busy, so we're very honored to have you with us today, Colonel Vindman. We thank you very much for this time. Well, thank you, Victor. Thank you, Jill. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, Always welcome the opportunity to talk to folks from uh, the Chicago area, just because I think Chicago has been particularly hospitable to me. Um, And, uh, you know, that... Glad to discuss all these things. Thank you. Likewise. Yeah. So let's get right into it. Um, So what really struck me about your book is just how you thread the needle from what you learned during your childhood, um, from your father's example, and um, your army training and experiences to your testimony during uh, former President Trump's first impeachment hearing. Um, So I'm wondering if you can talk more about some of those key lessons that you learned and um, how they shaped your actions in reporting um, what you saw as President Trump's wrongdoing. Sure. So, you know, it's interesting that that, uh, this is the the reason I I settled on this approach to memoirs, because there were a lot of questions as to why, you know, or how. How did uh, like a, you know, a a army officer challenge the, the commander in chief, the most powerful man in the world? And why? And I thought that there was an opportunity to kind of illuminate, you know, that in this country, that's actually okay. That's that's appropriate. If the pro, if the president is doing something unlawful, he's not above the law. And uh, that was my, my the that answered fundamentally the why. You know, why, how I see this country uh, ba- based on perspective, living overseas, coming to this country as a refugee, but also after that, living overseas in in South Korea. Um, uh, deploying to Iraq, uh, Ukraine, uh, Germany, uh, Russia, and seeing a lot of places where right just didn't matter, where uh, where the powerful were above the law, and then the the the, the so answering the question of why uh, how seemed like the next next question to answer, and I think it was a what I tried to do is uh, pull together the various tools that. I thought were instrumental in doing the right thing in the right way. So 
I'd say those were the key ones were my values that my, my dad first instilled in me, uh, de- a couple decades of military service and, and, uh, and effort to adhere to uh, the army values, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage. And then those, if those were explicit, there were a bunch of implicit lessons I learned. Um, you know, that we, we, as a military, um, and as a government tend to focus on the risks rather than, uh, understanding both the, the risks and the, the, you know, the, there's a formula that we apply. It's called um, probability and consequence. We tend to fo- fo- focus on consequence without uh, recognizing probability. And I, I pride myself on trying to calculate those out. So I, more, more accurate assessment of risk. So that's a, a, another thing. I think um, my experience in Russia uh, uh, indicated that I have I had a good sense of you know how countries go down the slippery slope towards authoritarianism. At one point, you know you. Russia was moving in the direction of a democracy. You see it play out in Poland and in Turkey and, and Hungary. And I uh, feared for that the direction our country was was going in with the erosion of institutions. Uh, so these are you know these are just a, a few of the areas um, that fed into my understanding of the situation and what I needed to do. And then really some to- some concrete tools like I talk about navigation, how to navigate, you know, simply I talk about it from a terrain perspective, but there was also navigating you know, perilous moments. I, I talk about uh, this idea of um, trying to, do, to to speak truth to power, we call it uh, not walking by a mistake. You know, we're, we're, uh, this, this is something that I've been encouraged to, to do throughout my military career. In a lot of ways, I think, you know, um, these all of these pieces came together uh in in a way that allowed me to to really meet some un- unprecedented challenges where there were no templates there were no there was no really uh good advice and then uh kind of take my own counsel to a certain extent on what to do next i i have to say um i forgot to mention that i was general counsel of the uh, army during the carter administration and I came to see the training that Army officers get and how the analytic skills of those people are. And so I was particularly interested in reading your book about not just your childhood and the lessons of your father, but how you took the lessons of an infantry officer. And then later, uh, and we'll talk more about this too, your training to be a foreign area officer, to work in foreign policy, really. Uh, not just on the ground as an infantry officer, but um, we want our audience to get to know you. Uh, So I want to briefly mention that you start your book, of course, talking about after you uh, came to America from Ukraine, uh, you vividly describe a very adventurous childhood in Brooklyn. You and your twin brother uh, got into quite a lot of mischief, I'd say. Um, You describe yourself as a late bloomer, and not focusing on school, but you did um, end up, despite that, receiving a full scholarship to American University. Unfortunately, in your book, you describe that you still didn't focus on school and you chose to focus more on ROTC, the Reserve Officers Training Corps program at the school. And so you ended up being dismissed from um, American University after three semesters. And because I don't think that everybody knows even what ROTC is, um, it might be good to describe, one, whether you think you made a mistake in your priorities in terms of education, academics, and staying at AU, um, or whether ROTC ended up being the best path to your career. You know, it's interesting. I think uh, it's hard to, to rationalize changing any of these uh, individual components because all of them combine to make me who I am. Um, you know, if I did not, if I had not kind of flunked out of school uh, because I, you know, just, I couldn't probably in, in certain regards, just couldn't sit still, couldn't sit through <laughs> like, you know, a, a, a lecture seminar or something like that and stay focused. Um, it's just, I, I needed to, and that's why, you know, in certain ways, I prioritized the RTCs because it was a, it was very physical and and athletic, and it was a good way for me to expend some of the excess energy 
uh, maybe in certain regards too much energy because then I didn't have any any energy for classes. But um, I think you know it's kind of interesting. Uh, the, fir- the 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 uh, first answer is of course I made enormous mistakes. <laughs> I may I should not have you know kind of discounted education. I should have not been kind of unfocused uh, in, in certain ways. I was probably unprepared uh, for so some of the freedoms of going into university. You know, from being kind of somewhat of a insular, um, introverted uh, guy in high school and stuff like that, and all that freedom may may have possibly been a little bit uh, uh, too too much for me at that point in time. You know, they, we didn't have I couldn't afford a gap year. We didn't have gap years back then. I don't think so. That probably would have served me well, but of course, I made some significant mistakes. But there are also mistakes that I learned from. Uh, I think at a, as because of that, uh, I. Um, forced myself uh, at a time where where academics weren't actually that hard uh, for me. They, were not, they weren't that hard for me in undergrad. They weren't that hard for me uh, in, um, I'm sorry, in high school. They weren't that hard for me. It's just I, I really like put no effort in whatsoever. But I just forced myself to stay focused and uh, completed um, my undergraduate. And I also kind of recognized that I set myself back, you know, on my heels in a major way. Uh, and uh, from the, uh, and at that point, you know, I worked extra hard as a as a military officer. You know, much much harder. Uh, let's say much harder than it would take to be a successful college student in a lot of ways. And then um, set my bar to 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 go to Harvard for masters. And now I'm at Johns Hopkins. So I overcame some of those deficiencies deficiencies um, and learned from my mistakes. But obviously, I, it didn't have to be that way. It could have made my life a heck of a lot easier. Um, but then I don't know. I, I wouldn't have had those uh, adverse experiences, and uh, you know, uh, there would have been all sorts of other decisions along the way that would have changed, like the ripple when, effect, I guess, or the butterfly absolute. effect. Or when you get lemons, mm-hmm. make lemonade, which you did, and you graduated from State <laughs> University of New York at Binghamton. Um, so, uh, go ahead, Victor. You had some questions. I'll be, I know. I'll be going back there. Actually, um, I, I just let them know today. They asked me to speak at homecoming. So this will be my first oh. trip back. Oh, fantastic. So I guess oh I'm gonna, I, did, I did something. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I pulled a rabbit out of a hat somewhere along the way. <sighs> well, I know this is perfect advice for college students like me. You know, I think this, just this notion of making a mistake, learning from them, and then using that as something that you can carry with you your entire life. But right after college, you completed um, an infantry course, basic training, served in uh, South Korea, Germany, and Iraq, where you um, earned a Purple Heart. Um, and you write a lot about the training that you received and the leadership lessons um, you learned during um, during your time in the military, as well as observing officers. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how the military really um, shaped you? Well, so uh, again, it's it's through a combination of uh, successes and failures. I was a, a pretty decent infantry officer. I mean, I, I knew my uh, small unit tactics. Uh, I was creative. Um, you know, I tried to, to uh, understand not just what I needed to do with my platoon, but what my, my seniors were, were trying to do. So I think that made for a pretty decent infantry officer. Probably, I mean, not the best, uh, far from the worst, but I was pretty good. Um, and I think that's, uh, I I also uh, talk about this Operation Cabbage Patch uh, thing uh, in Korea where I roll over this, uh, where this ve- my driver rolls over this vehicle and, you know, it takes a massive effort to, to extract it. Uh, and it was, it was a bit of a... Um, it was certainly a little uh, humiliating and I just kind of, you know, made a point to not, to not let su- stuff like that happen anymore. Uh, there's, there are these, um, trust, but verify is, is something that you, you, uh, you, you could learn the easy way, uh, or the hard way. I learned it the hard way. Um, I also learned a lot about navigating, which served me well as both an infantry officer, just, you know, not getting lost and, um, keeping my bearings is what I talk about when, I, when I'm going through, uh, the impeachment, but you know, uh, it came in handy. Let's say when I was in um, on the border between Russia and and Ukraine, and Russia's waging war against Ukraine, and they're pushing equipment across the border, and I'm in a position where I could kind of observe some of these things unfold. So, uh, I, it's it's a it's a it's a skill that served me throughout my my life. Um, you know, the, the, there are so those are maybe tangible lessons, but there are uh, intangibles also. 
um, about the importance of uh, service is something that I think um, certainly I, I uh, carried with me. Uh, I cherish my military experience and I advocate for now. I think it's important to understand that military service, um, state, federal, local community service is all extremely important into to, to achieving your own aspirations for, to become a better person. Because what you're doing is you're practicing something that's not centered and oriented on yourself. You're practicing something that's oriented uh, externally on your community. And because there's no personal gain, you train yourself, frankly, to do the right thing, um, you know, because the, the, the stakes are a little bit different. And you do that repeat, or repetitively and build what, what I refer to as muscle memory. Uh, and then as you face increasing challenges, you have something to fall back on. You know what the right thing is. With experience, you learn what the right way of, do, of managing uh, uh, different challenges are. And when you hit hit uh, at one of these, you know, inflection points, a, a critical challenge, you've actually built a history of, of, of dealing with challenges along the way, and it makes things a lot easier. And I think that that's, in certain ways, again, unprecedented to be in, uh, drawn into an impeachment, but I dealt with challenges all along the way, uh, you know, so, some successfully, some unsuccessfully, that allowed me to kind of figure out how to, how to navigate something that's extremely perilous and, and obviously in my case, even though I think I did it in the best way possible, uh, had some significant personal costs. So following up on what you're saying in terms of the skills you learned, um, and that includes uh, one of the dramatic examples was to pay attention to the absence of the normal or the presence of the abnormal. Um, but all of those skills seem to have served you well. They've been useful both on the battlefield and in your testimony and in your career um, when you were a, a military attache. And so when you transitioned from the infantry to strategic policy roles, was there additional training that the Army provided? Because one of the things I want to point out for our audience that most people probably listening don't know is how important education is in the military, how important degrees are that you don't get to be a higher ranked officer. You don't get to be a lieutenant colonel, a colonel, and certainly not a general without a minimum of a master's degree, and oftentimes much, much more than that. Um, so I am just would like you to talk about, in addition to the skills you learned for the battlefield, um, what else did they teach you so that you could go into basically foreign policy? Yeah, you know, it's it, it, that's an excellent point, Jill. I'll tell you that the military as a whole invests enormous resources yeah. in education um, to develop rounded, well-rounded officers. And I think uh, where where we end up calling, uh, coming short is when we, you know, waive some of the, the, the broadening assignments, waive some of these educations for exceptionally good officers that we want to keep in the force and, and, and you know, avoid pulling them out to, to do this developmental education. In my case, of course, as an infantryman, I did airborne, I did, uh, you know, uh, um, infantry officer basic course, which is for lieutenants, airborne school, ranger school, captain's career course, uh, command and general staff college, um, which is for majors ready. And then in addition to all that stuff, I did foreign area training. And, and those, those are not short programs. Those are like, you know, six month or year long commitments. Uh, so I just rattled off, uh, uh, of course, the airborne school is short and ranger school is relatively short, but the rest of them are pretty uh, healthy uh, commitments. And then um, as a foreign area officer, it's a three and a half year pipeline. I, what I ended up doing is when I got selected for that, I picked up a second language, so Ukrainian. I did it for almost a year uh, to build on, on to, uh, the fact that I had Russian skills, so more versatility in places I could serve. Um, then I went to uh, what's called in-region training. I received a pretty healthy budget to, to not just simply travel the, for, the, the uh, Eurasia, but to actually learn about the culture, learn about the defense enterprises, learn about um, you know the 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 political military situations in the, in those countries. And I had a chance to visit to to really traverse from like not just the, the uh, not just the the former Soviet space. Uh, for lack of a better word, but also to uh, the areas of importance around it, like Poland, Turkey, uh, China, as well as 
traveling to all the 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 Commonwealth of Indes, Independent States. And then I got sent to graduate school to Harvard for uh, a year and a half. And only after that did I get you know more specialized training as an attache. You go to uh, an attache course that allows you to uh, understand how to to be an effective uh, you know, to effectively observe and report on on a. Uh, uh, on the host country's military. Only after that did I go to my first assignment, which was pretty awesome. I went straight to Russia. It's not like the, the end of the career. I did it right at the beginning, uh, which is which is a pretty fantastic opportunity because I had a chance to see uh, the Russians, you know, roll out a hybrid warfare doctrine and implement that with regards to Ukraine, wage war in Ukraine, and then uh, after being assigned to the Pentagon, be uh, I was able to author the critical documents, the documents of record, the ones that are being used uh, mm -hmm. now to to face the challenges of Russia as a, an aggressor, uh, uh, somebody that employs, you know, hybrid warfare uh, against uh, the United States, for that matter. So um, and then that's how I made it to the White, to the White House, because of all, all I just had all these pretty awesome opportunities all along the way, one building on the other to get to that point. So you went from being a flunk out at AU to graduating, then going to Harvard and- That's a little hard going, still. Yeah, you know, well, it's true. I mean, you ended up at Harvard, you ended up in the Pentagon first and then at the White House. And when you were assigned to the Pentagon, you went right to the top. You went to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and um, then Trump was elected while you were there. Um, and for those who don't know it, the Joint Chiefs of Staff is the highest level in the military and it advises the president. So you were working on Russia policy, having just come from Russia and Ukraine, and you were working to improve relations. Did Trump's becoming president change U.S. policy or U.S. behavior? And I'm gonna draw a distinction between what we did versus what the official policy was in asking that well, that's question. A, that's a very, very useful distinction because uh, we did have a difference between the two. As a matter of fact, on paper, and up until the chief, uh, up through the uh, just uh, below the chief executive level, we had a credible policy that would I would say would fit within the band of like normal foreign policy. You know, you have you have uh, a conservative, you have a liberal um, uh, schools of thought on stuff, but it fit within that kind of normal range. We had a national security strategy that was developed in 2017. That was a pretty credible document that articulated a vision to advance U.S. national security. And really where the disconnect occurred, it was really specifically with the chief executive. It was the, it was the chief executive that tended to, when, when he inserted himself up and what, would have, what could have been a, a policy that advanced U.S. national security interests. We saw that repeatedly. Ukraine was just kind of like, you know, my firsthand experience with it, but he did that with regards to North Korea and to, to no avail. He basically uh, bought the North Korean regime years to continue to advance their nuclear program without without any consequences. D degraded our ability to deter, probably de uh, uh, sufficiently deter, I mean, we're de deterring them, don't get me wrong, but uh, be because we canceled a bunch of exercises, bilateral exercises between us and the, and the, uh, and the Koreans, that we, we reduced our capabilities there. The same thing could be said about you know his his policies with regards to China. In most cases, those tariffs were, uh, had massive blowback on on the U.S. and U.S. economy. So they he his his administration, not him, managed to do something with that. They managed to reorient on the kind of their emerging threat that China potentially poses that China poses to the United States and make gravy out of it. And the same thing happened with regards to the Russia policy. You know, the president wanted to engage with Vladimir Putin and uh, at least provided a little bit of ban uh, opportunity for the rest of the interagency to, to levy sanctions and consolidate kind of um, multilateral activities to push back on Russian aggression. But it's, again, in all, every case, it was the president himself that, that tended to be to, to upend uh, the way we were a deliberate, you know, crafted, reasoned foreign policy. So basically what you're saying is that he was not following the advice of the professionals um, that was coming from the Joint Chiefs of Staff while you were there. 
Well, it, it's, not, it's not even that, actually. Uh, I, you know, he was not willing to hear the advice too often or not willing to learn. Mm. You know, I would describe it as Trump probably didn't know any more on his last day office in office than he did on his first day in office. He, he was just not somebody willing to learn. Um, and, you know, that's different than taking the advice. You, uh, a chief executive has the, every authority to kind of weigh the, the uh, inputs he's receiving and, and come up with a value with a with a decision. That's what that's why he gets paid the big bucks. But that's not what he was doing. He was acting too often out of instinct and, you know, a, a lack of counsel or. As he did in the case of Ukraine for self-service, for personal gain. What and that's that's really that was you know the the major issue with with Donald Trump, and really as with his administration as time progressed because all those folks that were initially in positions you know, uh, that we called as guardrails or uh, qualified professionals you know slowly disappeared, and uh, you had second and third stringers uh, come in and uh, that were able to provide less capable advice and less, you know, uh, with less gravitas. Mm -hmm. So that's why things, you know, pro progressively got worse. Could you imagine what another four years would have been like? It would have been a disaster. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so while serving um, at, in the Pentagon, you interviewed with one of our previous guests, Fiona Hill, and transitioned to serve um, on the White House National Security Council um, staff with her team. You started with a focus um, on Russia, but then your portfolio was brought in to include Ukraine, Belarus, and um, Moldova. Why was that? Okay. That's that's funny. Uh, yeah. Uh, um by the way, her her book is coming out here shortly. So, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm personally uh, really excited to see it. Um, so, uh, I came there because of my my Russia my deep Russia background. Mm -hmm. um, what ended up happening is that there were, uh, there was a lack of staffing, and I had some requisite skills, including the fact that I had lived and served in Ukraine, and I had learned the the Ukraine language that. She she thought that there's that I could fill that role. In addition to that, she also recognized that there was just le uh, not as much to do on the Russia portfolio that, that she had hired me for because the president was not going to allow a very kind of uh, forward leaning uh, policy with regards to Russia to deter Russian aggression. We were only going to be able to take half measures. And while I, I, I joined what was supposed to be a two, a two man team, there was no you know, there was not going to be sufficient work. So what I did was I, uh, I organized a Russia external policy. I mean, I basically took a lot of things that I thought we needed to do with regards to, to Russia um, and uh, looked to harden its neighbors against Russian malign influence. And, um, you know, Fiona and I had a, a, a good conversation on this, on, on what we could do uh, that's not directly applicable to Russia. Um, I had the, the wherewithal, you know, putting together the plans for the Department of Defense to do this. And I picked up that, for, uh, that uh, fate, uh, it was a fateful decision to accept that, uh, you know, uh, expansion to my portfolio. So it sounds like you were doing a lot more kind of foreign policy and national and um, national security work at the NSC. Um, but one thing I was wondering while reading your book is um, your interactions with the State Department. You mentioned the firing of um, Ambassador Yovanovitch and uh, as well as um, Gordon Sondland. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about kind of how you shared information and coordinated with the State Department uh, to improve the roles and relationships with uh, Russia and Ukraine? So this is the, the two minute version of the, the way the NSC operates. There is a um, there are two fundamental mo models that are uh, recognized for the, the State Department. There is one in which the I'm sorry for, for the National Security Council. There is one in which the um, power is kind of centralized in in the National Security Council and the National Security Council kind of uh, develops and advocates for its own um, for ideas uh, that it develops. And then there is the the Scowcroft model, uh, General Scowcroft, where it, it arbitrates between uh, fairly arbitrates between departments and agencies that develop their own um, uh, policies for for what uh, within their own establishment uh, authorities. I think uh, in, in during my tenure, I try to do a combination of both. The um, Security Council is uh, um, National Security Council is uniquely positioned where it sits atop of all the departments and agencies. So it, it doesn't have a parochial view 
of you know state department doesn't have a parochial view of defense it looks across them and looks to coordinate across them so uh, i think it's important sometimes especially for complex challenges to have something that you know that uh that is cross-cutting and um at, implied in that role is coordination coordination across all the departments and agencies so i had the authority as a director for uh, for um um for the nsc to convene what are called um were at the time were called uh, sub policy uh, coordinating committees so i'm chairing a meeting with the deputy assistant secretaries of all the departments and agencies to develop policy for ukraine and uh then fiona would be chairing the the pccs the policy coordinating committees at the assistant secretary level then the deputies which is the the number two uh folks and then the, the principals uh and um that's that's really the way it works so i develop something and i push it up either i could execute on my own authorities uh meaning the authorities that are resident within departments and agencies or it has to go further up the chain and on several occasions it, it did have to go uh significantly further up the chain yeah, so someone who you had um, a, a working relationship with to improve um, relations with uh, with Ukraine in the upcoming elections was Ambassador Marie Ivanovich. And um, there was quite a dramatic moment when she got recalled. Um, and just for our audience, I guess, why do you think the Trump administration did that? And how common is it for an ambassador to get recalled um, from her post? So it might not be all that uncommon, but the way that this ambassador was recalled is you know, potentially unprecedented. Uh, what ended up happening is that there were there was a um, effort by the Ukrainian government to uh, end uh, Julia, uh, uh, Rudy Giuliani, uh, people in the president's inner circle, to um, cast Ambassador Ivanovich as a corrupt official. So, and these are, this is all completely false unsubstantiated, uh, you know, uh, just nasty business. And the U.S. government does not remove an ambassador because some corrupt official in some other country, you know, wants to, to taint the ambassador. That, that just doesn't happen. Otherwise, we'd have all sorts of countries trying to do that. So it's an, a, a terribly bad precedent. In this case, it was, again, in cahoots with, with uh, Trump's inner circle. Um, initially, it seemed like, you know, non, non-government officials Later on, it was clear that government officials were, were drawn into this thing. Uh, and she was removed because she was seen as a potential uh, uh, obstacle to realizing this investigation into Joe Biden. That's that's primarily why. And that's that's from the U.S. side. From the Ukrainian side, it was much, much simpler. She was she was um, she was critical of a prosecutor general that was uh, being that was corrupt and that was not serving the role and we were advocating for reforms and anti-corruption measures so uh the synergies between different corrupt officials uh on the u.s side and the ukrainian side got together and uh came up with this with this plan to to remove ambassador Ivanovich, who was a great great um diplomat so let's move forward from there because um after she was removed and um, you kept, of course, working to try to keep relations on track. And you were securing the um, election in Ukraine for the new president. And there was a new president elected, President Zelensky. And you actually got President Trump to do what I would call a normal congratulatory call with him. Um, but then right after that call, which went exactly as you had planned it, Things seemed to go off kilter. Um, things got strange, as you describe in your book. And the president um, changed plans about going to the inauguration of President Zelensky. He assigned the vice president, and then he forbid the vice president to go. And you ended up being the representative um, to go to the inauguration and to meet with all kinds of top officials. And you write that at that moment, you sort of knew that a network of people around the president, including Republicans in the legislative branch, were working on promoting these specious anti-Ukraine allegations. And I'd like to have you just very briefly talk about that, because um, we want to get into, of course, the July 25th phone call. Sure. So what's, in, what's important to realize is, uh, you know, as I put in the book, is it wasn't just a single phone call. It was a whole series of events that unfolded over the previous months 
that I, as the responsible official, had official had been watching and reporting on, reporting to to Fiona, reporting to John Bolton, the National Security Advisor, and uh, you could definitely see a, a turning point as uh, as Biden, President then Vice President Biden, was uh, became the front runner. And when he uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, this that's in 2019. That was before. But when he when he uh, seriously was considering, um, you know, his campaign, and right about when he announces is when you know the, there's a, a switch flipped, and this whole enterprise that was kind of just generally unfolding. My my understanding is that uh, Rudy Giuliani was looking to uh, to to help President Trump win a, a 2020 re-election and foreseeing Vice President Biden as the, the primary uh, opponent was was working on this enterprise. And then when Vice President Biden declared, uh, he had the president, he had Biden, I'm sorry, Giuliani had, um, had Trump's uh, attention and, uh, on this issue and uh, Trump's buy-in on this issue and then Trump's complicity on this issue. So let's... Yeah, let, let's go ahead with that. What what happened after that phone call, particularly when you listened in on the July 25th, 2019 phone call? Uh, and, and Victor, why don't you ask some questions about that? Yeah, I mean, well, obviously that moment was a pivotal one, um, not only in American history, but also um, yours as it turned out. Um, so I guess, yeah, like t maybe tell our audience a little bit about how you prepared for this call on um, July 25th, 2019 at 9 a.m. Yeah, so very quickly after the inauguration, we come back and, uh, you know, what we thought was a very successful visit was not perceived as such by, by the White House. It was an Oval Office visit uh, that I was requested to attend to. I declined uh, based on, you know, already uh, these troubling uh, indicators unfolding. Uh, and then... Shortly thereafter, there was a freeze on Ukrainian security assistance, nearly four hundred million dollars, and that was being that was done through non-official channels. It was done through a process that you know didn't really make any sense. So, I, I using this the process I laid out to you earlier, I drew it into the national security process. Uh, uh, you know, I convened these these meetings and made sure that people were on the record and that you know it couldn't just have been uh, it wasn't going to be something that remained in the dark. On July 10th, we had a visit from the Ukrainian National Security Advisor uh, with our uh, with the U U.S. National Security Advisor, and that was the first, frankly, the first time where, uh, you know, rather than getting reports of Mick Mulvaney and um, you know other officials uh, putting the freeze on Ukrainian security assistance, I heard firsthand. Gordon Sondland say, in order to get a White House meeting, uh, that President Zelensky had to d deliver this this uh, investigation, and I immediately reported that to, um, you know, uh, uh, I reported to the the proper authorities, and Fiona and, and I had a, a, a couple of conversations about it. Uh, she also had a conversation with John Bolton. We were all pretty much on the same page. We were not going to participate in something like this. And then two weeks later was this was this, was this congratulatory call that. I, again, I prepared for like I did the previous time. I put together all the background papers, the talking points. You know what? What uh, it was supposed to be a congratulatory call. This was an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented event in Ukraine where uh, President Zelensky's brand new party that didn't exist months before won a majority, which is also unprecedented. Never had there been a party that won, uh, you know, a majority in the parliamentary election. So should have been a no-brainer, but uh, uh, it, it turned out that you know the only reason that call landed. Was because uh, Gordon Sondland connected with uh, Mike, uh, Mick Mulvaney and um, you know basically assured him that Zelensky was going to deliver an investigation, and that's why the president joined. So I guess what was your reaction to President Trump asking President Zelensky to investigate not just any U.S. citizen, but the son of a major presidential candidate, and kind of walk us through maybe that process of like how how did you feel afterward? You talked about reporting up the chain of chain of command, but I mean, did you think it was a crime at the moment? Were you conflicted? Um, like what, what type of advice did you seek as you made that decision to report it up? It was visceral and ins instantaneous. I understood immediately what the implications were uh, domestically and overseas. I understood that, uh, you know, had Zelensky delivered on this, it would have broken U.S. support for, for Ukraine, uh, which isn't altruistic. It's it, Clearly, in, it's centrally in U.S. national security interests to have uh, a, a strong Ukraine 
as a bulwark against Russian aggression. Um, you know, there's a famous uh, quote by Zygmunt Brzezinski that about Russia with Ukraine automatically becoming an empire, absent, um, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and that was, these things all flashed through my mind, you know, processed very, very quickly. And then uh, the most important, most important factor, of course, was the fact that the president was looking to tip the scales, uh, impede free and fair elections. It was not an investigation into Hunter Biden. It was an investigation into Joe Biden that he was looking for. And I knew right away what, what I was going to do. I mean, there was no hesitation. I was going to report it to the proper authorities. And so what happened, I guess, what did you think should happen? And then what happened afterward in reality um, after you reported that? Well, what I would, what I was hoping it would happen is that these these authorities would uh, that have that are you know s- more senior officials with direct access to the president on a on, on a habitual basis, attorneys uh, that could uh, counsel him on the fact that what he was proposing was criminal would go and say, uh, Mr. President, you can't do this. I thought that that could reverse the pre- the president made countless ill considered decisions and reverse course on them. That's one thing that people don't recognize. He was constantly making mistakes and then having to undo those. He didn't, he hated to do it publicly, but he, in this case, he wouldn't have to do it publicly. And I thought there was a good chance that, you know, that if he received the counsel, they would, uh, he would reverse course. We'd lift the hold on security assistance. You know, the Ukrainians might get their meetings and so forth and uh, support this president that was still in the midst of a war with the Russians uh, and uh, Mm -hmm. undertaking reforms and anti-corruption measures. What didn't happen is, uh, that didn't happen. The the senior attorneys did not counsel the president, as far as I can tell, on on his, you know, potentially criminal activity. And uh, what ended up happening instead is, uh, in my coordinating coordinating role, I had a couple of conversations with folks. And, um, you know, I can't be definitive because I don't know if it was, if if I was the sole reporting officer or if I was the, 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 the person that kind of, Kind of uh, provided the, the information for the whistleblower complaint, but another individual made the righteous decision to recognize that this was not going to be corrected in house. I was trying to use the proper channels, using a military officer using the chain of command, uh, trying to fix it from the inside from a pretty not from a pretty lofty position. I thought I could do something, and then uh, the other individual, uh, other somebody else, think thought that that was not going to be the case. They thought you know this there were no checks. Uh, nobody was going to take any actions on it and proceeded to to make a complaint that ultimately worked its way through Congress. So in a way, the checks kind of worked. You know, I did my job to a T. I reported it. I coordinated like I was supposed to. Uh, at the same time, somebody uh, uh, initiated a whistleblower complaint. And then while all that stuff was kind of easy, it was behind the scenes that, yes, I was taking some, some heat for it and uh, being targeted for retaliation. But all that was be- behind closed doors. It wasn't until it became public and then I had to. I knew that I was going to, you know, st- stand by my position. I wasn't going to back paddle. I wasn't going to be kind of, you know, uh, pr- a careerist or, or protect my own career. That I was going to uh, provide t- testimony, uh, full, complete testimony. Um, that you know, that's when I I took on much, much more significant risk. So, um, do you know who the whistleblower is? Uh, I don't know who the whistleblower is. I mean, I I could suspect who the whistleblower is. Um, I'll take your speculation. <laughs> no, uh, but I, I mean, the, 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 you know, the interesting thing about this is uh, there's a cost to this. You can't just speculate and then be wrong and, and you know, upend somebody's life. Those, this is the real world. I mean, could you imagine the, the catastrophe that that would be? And especially if the fact that, you know, what, uh, if I'm wrong. So I, I refuse to, to, to be speculative on, on this thing. And uh, recognizing what I went through, <clears throat> uh, and uh, putting that on somebody else. So uh, that's you're, up you're to of that course person. correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're correct. You're correct obviously. obviously. Right. But I think it's up to that person. You know, at some point to you know if they, if they wish to, to share their story, um, you know, it, it would be interesting to hear what was going through their mind or so. But it's uh, um, you know we'll see how that turns out. But the result of it, in any event, was that there were several congressional committees that started investigating, and eventually the House Judiciary Committee had a formal impeachment inquiry, um, and they did vote two articles of impeachment, but 
Of course, we know President Trump was acquitted by the Senate on a straight party line vote. Um, you were one of the witnesses before the uh, closed door session investigation well, as correct, well as uh, Mitt, Rom Mitt Romney. You're came right. Through, yeah. On one. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Mitt right. Which is unprecedented. Yeah. I, I knew he was going to do that, frankly. I, uh, I don't know if I don't remember if it's actually in the book, but I remember bumping into him uh, outside of the West, West Wing and uh, having a conversation with him and, you know, just having a conversation about like, you know, moral courage and doing the right thing. And I had every belief mm -hmm. at that point that he was going to do the right thing. OK, so um, you're right, of course, that it was the one lone vote on one of the articles of impeachment. Um, and I want to talk to you about what it was like as you were sitting in front of Congress, um, a lieutenant colonel testifying against the president. Um, and but before we ask you how it felt to do that, I want to talk about how you prepared to be there. And I don't mean just your life of service and your life of training, but specifically, what, what did you do to prepare to be in that p testimonial position? So I, re I retained counsel. Um, I, you know, I go through in the book about how I did that and, yeah. you know, um, you know, uh, some, some thoughts to selecting Republican uh, uh, stalwarts to, to um, try to, um, you know, not, um, I guess, to, to ensure that I you know the the White House wasn't wasn't going to you know come after me and target me immediately. So I, I was just thoughtful about doing that. I did, uh, I, you know, I, we, I did kind of relatively standard preparation. I talk about this in the book also. You know, attorneys want you want to go over each question and have, rehearse each answer. And that's not the way I work. That's not the way my mind works. And, uh, you know, they figured out pretty quickly that I didn't need that kind of prep. Uh, I also re recognized I didn't need that kind of prep because I was just being truthful and I didn't have to keep a story straight. So uh, we still, you know, still kind of went through the different possibilities and different kinds of questions and stuff like that. Uh, and rather than kind of rehearsing answers, I just, you know, uh, w it was a way to um, think through the, the different possibilities. And then... Um, Ultimately, um, I was called to testify in a closed door test in a closed door hearing on October 29th, and uh, that went. You know, that was the first time I'd done anything quite like that. Probably a tiny bit more nerve wracking. Although uh, I think as as time wore on, wore on, I I you know uh, eased into it, and um, you know maybe the other side was getting a little bit flustered because they couldn't they couldn't really you know. They couldn't impugn my uh, in integrity so much. Uh, they couldn't deal with the facts. They could make process arguments about, you know, the the why the Democrats were were conducting uh, these hearings and stuff like that. And then you know, a couple of weeks later or so, uh, I I had the uh, public testimony. At which point, you know, I became um, um, I, I you know I, be I became a public figure. So you describe the closed door hearings as really worse than your public testimony, that it was so partisan. Um, can you describe that, what you mean by that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I had come into uh, maybe a little bit naively into this, um, into this with, you know, the expectation that, uh, yes, the Republicans are going to try to cast a situation, the situation in a, in a friendly light to the president. And the Democrats are going to uh, pursue, uh, you know, uh, pursue evidence, uh, attempt to get straight answers to, to, to um, you know, what had it unfolded with regards to uh, the phone call and so forth. But I didn't necessarily expect kind of the the, the really harsh treatment by Republicans uh, that in fact, you know, tended to portray themselves as uh, friends of the military friends of, uh, of uh, you know, public servants and things of that nature. So uh, I, that was something that I, you know, just wasn't necessarily prepared for, like, you know, smiling, grinning uh, 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 remarks by Republicans that, um, you know, were disingenuous and, and stuff like that, like Cheshire cat or something like that. Um, but, um, you know, but anyway, I, I, I definitely felt myself kind of ease into it once I, once I did, once I, you know, got my bearings, uh, you know, going back to the 
navigation um, metaphor. I got my bearings, and uh, it was it was it wasn't really all that hard because you know when when uh, when somebody would say something, non- I wasn't looking to cater to either side. I was going to be uh, 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 you know full throated and, and truthful. But you know when somebody made some sort of ridiculous claim about something. I could expound at nauseum about the reality of the uh, geopolitics or about the national security issue or about what's going on in Ukraine. When somebody said something about like, you know, the, uh, about Burisma, the, this, this firm that um, Hunter Biden worked for, I could, I could, you know, just punch through that kind of the, the rhetoric uh, or about investigations or about the personalities because I'd been working these issues and, and studied it. And, you know, they, they just were not prepared for that, I don't think. Well, I'd recommend that people read your book because I think your description of being in that closed door uh, hearing is really quite dramatic and also shows how analytic you are and how you were able to sort of take what you were doing to try to figure out where was the questioner really going so that he wouldn't lead you into a trap, which is partly based on, I think, your military training. But after it was over, after the public testimony, and you're becoming quite a well-known figure. It had a big impact on you. It had a big impact on your career. It had a big impact on your family. I'm I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about whether, you know, your relationship with your father, who was opposed to your coming forward for a variety of reasons, um, and, and maybe your most dramatic testimony was your opening in which you describe how in America, this is the right thing to do. Um, but I'm wondering if there was any special problems with your family, particularly. I mean, your brother had always been very close with you. Now you were a superstar. Did that have any you know, impact on your relationship with him? Talk about the more personal stuff. Sure. Sure. So, uh, of course, there was, a, you know, an enormous amount of upheaval. I think something that people don't recognize about, like, whistleblowers that do the right thing, somehow, like, the cl- the clouds part and, you know, the sun's shining or something like that, like, you know, yeah. from Hollywood. And it's not the way it happens. I mean, there is a – I, I frankly, was well-positioned to land on my feet in certain ways because I had a, 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 a track record of successes and, you know, degrees and, and all that kind of stuff and a, and a network that I could fall back on. But uh, that's not necessarily the case with whistleblowers. With regards to the question about my father, um, you know, he was speaking from a, a, a place of, of love and, and care for me. And his concerns were that I was going to upend my life. And uh, he just wasn't, he didn't understand all the kind of the, the, the details or what was at stake. So his counsel was to, you know, try, try to reconcile with the president. But again, that was from a place of because I didn't, I couldn't talk to him. It was it was classified at the time, uh, so he was just giving it general counsel, <clears throat> and also he didn't believe that the president would be that corrupt. He was a uh, 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 he had voted for Trump in 2016, and um, you know he had thought that this would be a, a good outsider that could shake things up or something like that. Once the the facts became clear, of course there was no question about where where this is not one of those stories about families being torn apart. I had my my the devotion to my father. Same thing with my the, my other family members that you know they they were concerned about my uh, how things might settle out with my my life and, and career, and uh, you know they were urged caution and I weighed all that and then just kind of like I, I point out in the book I took my own counsel I you know I I had to ultimately have to lead live with the decisions, and um, you know my family might describe that as stubborn. Uh, my, my twin brother, uh, you know, who's, I'm very, very close with, I'm, I'm close with my wife and my, uh, uh, daughter, um, I'm close with my, my twin brother. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit tough and I try to pull him into as much stuff as possible. And, uh, I, you know, it's, we were always like neck and neck on everything that we did. And now, uh, I have this like massive public presence, so it's a little bit tough. And I'm uh, thoughtful of that and try to keep him included and, and um, you know, uh, not like the typical kind of give, giving him a hard time stuff because uh, yeah, he's, he's facing challenges, too, as a result of this. Um, and he yes. doesn't get any of the accolades. Yeah, he doesn't get any accolades. Um, so I, it's, he deserves them. Yes. And for those who don't know, not only were you fired as, in retaliation for having come forward, but so was he. 
so that that's just something now, our audience needs. He's to now know. wrapping up his military career, also, frankly, because uh, he's facing the same he's facing the same headwinds. Even though he's promoted to colonel, he's frankly facing the same headwinds I did, recognizing that the military was conservative. Uh, I became radioactive, and the military did, didn't want me, no matter how capable I was, because of <clears throat> because of concerns that they would be con uh, considered partisan or. I would reflect on on their kind of uh, commands and leadership. So um, I found no possibility of staying on after, uh, to my wife's chagrin, an exhaustive period um, of, of review. Um, so it was, yeah, it, it was. Uh, a, a, it's it, he's unfortunately wrapping up his military career. Also, sorry about that. I mean, your life trajectory has just been so inspiring. I think a model for anyone who wants to get involved and kind of find their way in public service and um, in public service and politics. And I'm wondering if you have any plans beyond what you're doing now after you earn your doctorate. Um, what's in store for you? So I've got like five or six jobs of, of different kinds uh, at the moment, um, partially because I haven't quite figured out what I want to do. Um, I... I knew that uh, I could still contribute to national security and the na dialogue around national security. I could, frankly, now with a uh, with a public voice, uh, contribute to uh, holding accountable leaders that fall short um, of their obligations to their oaths or or to institutional values. I could advocate for public servants, so I, I'm doing that. Working on a doctorate uh, at, at Johns Hopkins writing on uh, great power competition, writing on the impact of mm -hmm. Russia, Ukraine on U.S. foreign policy. Uh, you, you mentioned in the intro the, the various other things I'm doing. I think uh, that the renewed democracy effort that I'm a part of is really key because of the, the, the uh, nature of our political environment and how polarized it is, looking for solutions to these, these uh, vexing issues. Um, teaching is a possibility. Maybe there's another stint in government somewhere along the way. Um, who knows? Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, I'm I'm looking to find my footing to to figure out what I what it is I want to do over the long term. When when you mention uh, a possibility of going back to government, I'm just wondering, um, is there anything that the current administration could do to rectify the wrong? You were on the promotion list to colonel and would certainly have made um, been promoted had it not been for this. Um, retaliation. And I, I'm wondering if there's some way that you could get that promotion and come back to government. Is there anything that can be done about that? You know, it's, uh, I find that hard to imagine. Uh, the Biden administration has a full plate of, uh, of, uh, of a, a policy agenda that they want to fulfill, that they want to deliver based on the platform, a whole host of crises, and uh, an unaddressed issue with regards to accountability from the previous administration. I think uh, you know little uh, little old Alex Vindman is, is, doesn't fit into that calculus. Well, um, given everything you have done in service to this country, um, and and you do describe an outpouring of support from ordinary Americans following your testimony, as well as the ugliness from the right wing media, but I'm hoping that you will remember only the good things and the outpouring of support that you got, rather than the ugliness, and we know you're going to succeed in whatever you do next, so good luck to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation with Colonel Alexander Vindman as much as I did, and that you'll come back again next week for another episode of iGen Politics. Thank you for being with us. <laughs>